So thank you very much for joining us and I hope and wish that next time we will be in Crete giving the same or even an updated slightly uh, version of this talk. Okay, that's up to you now. Thank you very much, Ian. Thank you so much, Yanis. Yeah, it, it is, uh, yeah. I, I, first of all, I'm, I'm deeply appreciative too for, for giving this talk because uh, as Yanis as said, we worked together uh, t over 20 years ago and I also never thought that I would work on low bitrate speech coding again it was dead and suddenly it just all came back and uh, in this talk now I mean it unfortunately uh, there are like two fields the, the, uh, the uh, uh, computer science neural network approach uh, and the signal pre signal processing people like myself uh, different approaches to the these problems uh, and they rarely spoke in the past but now we're, we're all talking which is good but what I wanted to do with this talk is to try and connect that whatever we do now today is basically just a continuation of what people did since yeah uh, early 40 50s when it comes to electrical and even before that uh, uh, in, in with mechanical uh, so I'm going to try to connect the old world of speech coding with the new world of generative synthesis. And hopefully in the end of the talk, you will figure out, like I think I have, that's basically just another way of generating the speech waveform. Uh, but it follows the same principle as, as, uh, as the old ones. With that being said, uh, let's dig in. So uh, what I hope to cover today, I think I will have, I have plenty of time, so I will cover uh, these uh, six, maybe uh, yeah, these six topics. First of all, I'm gonna go back to the roots and try to figure out the synthesis, uh, synthesis way, uh, speech synthesis with the source filter model. I, I mean, I haven't seen previous talks, but I think you probably heard of the concept. And also in the same th uh, same way uh, that you, you you the earlier talks probably has gone deeper into the neural networks than I will do today because I'm going to focus on uh, speech compression that kind of perspective uh, perspective of this thing. So speech coding will be kind of the main topic, which, and uh, especially linear predictive coding, which is a very nice mathematical and kind of uh, anatomical modeling uh, that kind of merges very, very conveniently and is, is kind of the dominant, dominant, I would say the dominant way of doing speech coding up to today. And now and then we'll move over to the, uh, the modern way, like we, we created this or went into this uh, venture a couple of years ago to coding with the, uh, the generative neural synthesis. I will talk about a, a couple of different approaches to that, and especially one that go, go, uh, is a generative synthesis, but will also co cooperate some old school signal, uh, di digital signal processing, the LPC net. I, I don't know if you've heard of it, but it basically takes uh, the signal processing take care of some parts and let the, um, the neural network take care of the, the, the hard part. And in the end, I will also hopefully cover uh, practical aspects of uh, speech coding. Uh, in text-to-speech and in most speech synthesis, uh, we are not concerned about anything else than just pure clean speech, which these, these met methods are fantastic and very well, well suited for that. Unfortunately, in the real world, we need to, first of all, if we're going to do communication, we need to do it in real time. So we need to be fast to so process this, uh, uh, process the audio. And, but also everyone, no one is, oh, most people are not sitting in a studio both and talking on a phone. So we must handle like background noise and stuff. And unfortunately, most of these methods don't really handle it. I'll hopefully show you some, um, Play, play some audio samples, what happens in background noise, and I talk a little bit on a pro approach that we've taken to, to uh, 
reduce the, uh, the sensitivity to background noise. All right. So the first thing is to go back uh, and talk a little bit about the source filter modeling for synthesis. And we all go back to how voice is produced in our bodies. Uh, I think most of the pictures I'm, I'm using here are taking them from the public domain. So, and I found this one on Wikipedia, uh, which is an anatomic model of of the voice uh, speech production. Uh, there's a lot of small small details here, but the so but I highlight lighted the. Uh, most uh, important ones. So sound, speech sounds are made from air coming from the lungs, going up through the larynx where we have a vocal folds that looks like a little bit like a lip. So it goes up and down like this and if, to make a uh, periodic sound. And that little, that little opening there is called a glottis. And I think you had some someone mentioning the glottal vocoding the other day. Uh, so that's the uh, source, the, the real na uh, natural source for, uh, for periodic sounds. And if for the unvoiced sound, the fricatives and the plosives, you, these, uh, you still have, the, you still have uh, the airflow from the lungs, but then your articulators will, uh, in the rest of the mouth, will uh, form the sound. The, this little periodic sound, if you just look at the uh, periodic sounds, then it goes from the glottis up through uh, the throat there into main, two main cavities. There is the oral cavity um, with, um, where in the mouth and the nasal cavity up to the nose. And uh, finally, uh, the sound is uh, radiated through the nostrils and the lips. And all these things uh, are shaping the sound. And they are, the cavities are, it's, it's very basic. There are these, the sound waves goes in, go in there and uh, the shape of the, the, the oral cavity, the, uh, all of this called the vocal tract, all, all, all the stuff, uh, these, uh, uh, this space in here in the head. Uh, the forms of sound is called the vocal tract. And our articulators, the tongue, the lips, and the teeth, and so on, move around and shape the, uh, this tube of air and all these resonances. So this kind of uh, is the origin of the uh, source filter concept. So, so this is the basic concept that everyone, uh, when we talk today, like to the Zoom meeting, this, this concept is in the sp speech processing that we're using and that we're listening to. So there is a source uh, generating a sound, a, a basic sound. It could be a, a voiced or an unvoiced. Bzz, and then the rest is formed by a filter, just a plain, simple, passive filter, uh, acoustic filter that it's all is, is the vocal tract and the lip and nostril radiation. That's the thing. That's the source filter modeling. And this has been around for so many years. And I don't think most people know how long it's been. Uh, it's been since, since, the, uh, since the 18th century or even earlier. So the first mechanical synthesis using this principle was uh, von Kempelen. He worked on this machine for many years, and it's a very simple model, but yet I think it's amazing. Uh, it's mostly voice synthesis, although you can mechanically try to get some consonants like stops, and uh, but not so much. Yes, of course. Uh, actually, you can get, um, you can just, uh, it was an artifact of, of, of the model that, through the leakage, and you, you could actually produce some unvoiced sound with the air coming out through, uh, leaking out through the system. But the, there is a, just a bellows that you use for the kitchen oven for the, for the fire. 
that is the lungs. So you put your hand on the lung and you pressed it. And then there was a little glottis, a little uh, a reed from a bagpipe. In the end, uh, in in that uh, in the end of the bellows, that and then there was a little rubber. In, in the first mo model, he had like a clarinet, a, f a hard little little uh, clarinet horn, but then he changed that to a, a more a, a rubber one, so that you can form it. But these little this little thing coming out from this thing, yeah, is is the basic excitation the source then you'd filter it with your hands in this box you put your hands over the little mouth and you form vowels by that uh, it's not very complicated but with it it sounds you can actually get some uh, some um, vowel sounds i hope that i can share a video let's see now if i do this Uh, stop share and share another screen oh i'm not a host anymore okay sorry C can you make me a host yep let's do it again uh, let's see can everyone see this one yes yeah. okay let's hope that you can hear it too Stop sharing. This was good before. Stop share, then share again. Let's see, share screen. Are we back? Yes, we are back. Okay. okay thank All right. Can you do? Okay. So that's that's uh, an, okay, an old source filter model. Uh, so then let's fast forward to electro electronic time. Uh, Homer Dudley worked at Bell Labs in the 30s and the 40s, actually into the 50s, and he uh, he started a big prop. Uh, he started what we now call a channel vocoder. He started this, uh, this project called the vocoder, voice coder and decoder. As a part of this system or this project, they also started a, um, an ex uh, this is mostly an exhibit uh, project called the voter. And the voter was a full article, uh, a full system with this speech unvoiced and voiced speech. Uh, there was an operator sitting in the middle and it was a she because there were 20 uh, women trained for this. Uh, they, she, they, she had a keyboard where, where she could control uh, bandpass filters. And, and it's, it's like a filter bank that she could control and also, she had a switch for voice and non-voice, and the, she could control the pitch 
of the pulse train with a pedal. So it was completely manually operating. However, I mean, you have to do a lot of different sounds and you have to train how to, comp how to generate these. So you needed a highly trained uh, operator and they trained for a year. And they say that the, they started with like a couple of hundred girls because there was girls at that time because these were all at this time like there were former secretaries so they will have um, they're skilled in typewriting and you needed to you needed to make like 10 different sounds per second because that's the typical speaking speaking rate and the different uh, phonemes per, per sound seconds that we do uh, so this 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 uh, exhibit thing is, is may completely manually operated. Uh, this, the, this, as I said, this is a, was a part of the vocoder project. And in the vocoder project, uh, it was both analysis and synthesis. So the synthesis part was driven by analysis, which is just, uh, you know, uh, like taking uh, the opposite of this. So you analyze the, uh, the bandpass, uh, the energy is in different bandpass, the voicing and pitch, uh, so to control this parameter. But as I said, this is uh, controlled manually and is very, uh, I think is amazing. So now we have to do this again, video, and I have to stop share. And then I go to this. No. Share screen. Get a sentence. For example, Helen, will you have the voters say, she saw me? She saw me. That sounded awfully flat. How about a little expression? Say the sentence in answer to these questions. Who saw you? She saw me. Whom did she see? She saw me. Well, did she see you or hear you? She saw me. Now, so far, you have only heard the voter speak in one voice. But the voter has other voices which he can use when Miss Harper makes a simple adjustment in his mechanism. Helen, will you have the voter say, Greetings, everybody? Greetings, everybody. Now, will you have him repeat that in a high voice? Greetings, everybody. And now, in his best face. When a boy's voice changes, he's never quite sure whether it's going to be a tenor or a bass. And the voter, being still a comparatively young man, also has his moments of uncertainty. Let's hear him recite, Mary had a little lamb. Gosh, voter, you sounded awfully dismal. Okay. <clears throat> if we look at uh, this in a signal processing or it's like a signal way, <clears throat> the source could be either a pulse train, a periodic source, or a non-periodic random noise source. And so the ex we can see that is an excitation signal u of z or un in the time domain and you're have you're having a switch uh, if you voiced or unvoiced and of course you could have a mixed voice too for the z and the v, these kind of sounds too i mean it's uh, it's optional how to control this this uh, switch here but in the, in the basic form is a switch voiced unvoiced and then all of the resonances all of the spectral shaping is done by a simple filter and uh, we, the lip radiation and the nostrils and all of that, we just disregard, uh, uh, disregard. We put them all together because they're all a form of a passive filter that we can control with parameters. And out comes the speech. Yeah. All right, that was the background of the source filtering. Now we're gonna use this for something 
different than te text to speech and we're going to use it for speech compression and what is speech coding and compression well it's came as as the need for to store if especially in digital um, for co coding is compression of the speech uh, and, and, and like digital compression, you know, this is where, where, what I'm talking about here. So you do an, an analysis of the speech and you extract a bunch of parameters, if, depending on your type of analysis. These parameters need to be either transmitted to the other side or stored for later retrieval. To do that, you take all these, all these parameters and make uh, quantize them first and so that there are discrete values and then you represent these discrete values with bits uh, for, for a digital way and the channel you send them over a channel and that channel could either be like a storage channel you, or you store it on magnetic recording media or you send it over the air or to the other side it could be air wire and uh, the channel could modify it but you, it's it's very likely that these bits will be uh, corrupted that's in, in the decoding part there when you con uh, when you convert these bits back to parameters uh, you, you can take care of like error corrections and stuff and control of that the lossy channel, if there is a lossy channel. But that's the decoding part. And then these parameters that are decoded, then they are of course not exactly the same thing as the ones that we cut from the analysis because there is a, there's a degradation step or maybe two, the quantization errors and then maybe the channel errors. But in the end, the uh, synthetic speech is the decoded speech comes out from the speech synthesis. So these, this entire chain is kind of called the coding chain. If we then look at, okay, if we are just going to extract parameters and send them over and use these parameters to generate speech, uh, how low can we go then? Uh, how wouldn't, what is the most efficient way to do that? And that's kind of the coding. Coding is trying to make this efficient as possible, as few bits as possible. Uh, and then we can think about what, what's the limit then? How, how low can we go? Take for instance, a, a system that just take the input speech like we have today and just do the best speech recognition we have today. I mean, this is, this is possible today. Uh, you can take speech recognition output, you know, all the text, the, the phonemes, the text, if you wanted to put it into a more compact form you, you make text from with the phonemes but you can and they also have to transmit you can transmit like intonation prosody and who is speaking and whether he or she is angry or sad or so the emotions can be transmitted and then you take a regular text to speech and use these input parameters to produce it so this text to speech synthesis as i guess most of you are familiar with you can do that uh, that will be very, very efficient. Uh, today we can do this. Uh, in the 50s, when uh, Shannon started thinking about entropy and information rate, he, they couldn't do this, but they, he, he, so he did some estimates and not only him, he, he provided a system with a simple system to do it, like looking at the entropy of, uh, uh, the entropy of characters in English and and two, three, four characters, and like then forming uh, more like phonemes and stuff, uh, longer words. And uh, some other people did with more with uh, like they take like eight to ten thousand English words and try to 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 get the entropy of that. And then someone else tried to figure out how quickly you talk. And I think some I don't remember who. That's why I didn't put it. But, in the end, they came up with approximately 50 bits per second is the, is the lower limit of sending data for speech. And that should capture uh, who's talking and, and uh, all, all the essential information. That's if you go purely by lexical, I mean, characters and English and linguistic 
uh, information you have. Uh, another information theoretic uh, approach was taken by Fano. He was looking at, uh, I don't know if, uh, uh, this is not as well known as the other one, but he was looking at it as from the channel, like um, channel theory about like noisy channels and how to decode uh, uh, symbols on the noisy channels. So he was looking at like acoustical noise and the transmission of the acoustical uh, signal. And he got a more uh, pessimistic uh, uh, estimate of how to get the, uh, especially, okay, so he had about three, three kilobits per, three kilobits per, uh, kilobits per second for wideband speech, but for narrowband, like regular telephony, he got, he got down to about 1600 bits per second needed to transmit the acoustic wave of English. Uh, this this uh, has recently been uh, act, uh, kind of up to date again, because people are not, it, it never went away actually. Uh, during the 80s and the 90s, and when I was in the 90s, when I was active in speech coding there, people did a lot of, uh, I did too, <laughs> try to figure out the lower, lower limit of speech coding. But the recent estimate, this is from ICASP 2017, uh, uh, one, uh, Stephen Van Kirk and uh, his friends, they took, took some similar Fano approach, acoustic approach, but made it, a little, or added some more uh, recent advances and got down to approximately 100 bits per second. So this is the current estimate. So, if you, so that's kind of the goal with speech coding. With 100 bits per second, you can transmit anything in a clean speech. Uh, for, it's not an, there's uh, in clean speech. So this uh, experiment was for clean speech. But all of these theoretical limits, these estimates, uh, even if, if we want to do it practical, I haven't done this, but uh, I was thinking about that yesterday, that actually I want to do this, uh, take these ASR and uh, text-to-speech and see how, how low we can go uh, with current tools today, it's assume a very long delay because a TTS, uh, TTS is not so uh, crucial, but for ASR, you, you, you need to see uh, maybe a half a second or something or less, slightly less, but that's completely too long delay for uh, interactive speech communication. So if you want to go to two ways, this is a very cumbersome uh, mechanism. So for practical speech coding, what or this is what has been done. Uh, this is you know, since since maybe the this is the state of practical speech coding since uh, since eighties, I think. Uh, the, the, there are two uh, two major groups of speech compression algorithms. We have these parametric codecs. Uh, this vocoders, this robotic sounding ones that are, you can produce a very low bit rate, uh, even lower than 1000, like 300 bits per second. And uh, it could of course go up to, uh, because it's, it's taking, uh, have a model and you extract parameters. And then of course, if you quantize them with infinite bits, so you can, you can of course go up to how, how high you want, but it doesn't really matter because it will never sound better because it's com the quality is completely limited to the model. It doesn't matter how many bits you give to it because it's, it's, it's a model uh, restricting. And all of these parametric coders, most of them, I haven't seen them uh, when, we st when we started doing these experiments a couple of years ago. We, there are no, not many at least, I, I, maybe not, not, I haven't found one. So, uh, more than uh, a wideband parametric coder. <clears throat> so it's, it's limited to narrowbands in 8 kilohertz sampling. The other class are the classical uh, waveform coders uh, that are waveform. So for instance, just taking PCM, you take the sample and you quantize each sample. And if you and the idea is to match the coder to so get the waveform try to match the, uh, the actual samples, incoming samples as good as possible. So 
in that sense, if you're the more bits you get, uh, you're, the closer you get to the actual incoming wave. So there is no limiting quality if 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 you if you define the quality as fidelity, because if you get infinite rate, you get perfect reconstruction of the incoming wave. And uh, for waveform coders, they they go all the way from narrow bands to telephony to uh, a wide band, which is typical VoIP, like we have today here, and full band too, if you wanted uh, for uh, for um, uh, high quality audio and, and stereo. And as you see in this little schematic plot there, as a, uh, the parametric codex, there is a limit of, there is the model that kind of limits how well you can sound and but the waveform coders but the problem with waveform coders is, is that at low at low rates you, if you try to mimic the, the incoming uh, waveform it get does a really poor job that's why the parametric coders are popular or successful at lower rates so <clears throat> and as an example of uh, a, a source filter vocoder it operates in the frequency domain I'm taking this open source codec called Codec 2. Uh, it's the good thing with the, most of the codecs I talked about today. You know, I mean, you can get them uh, uh, and play around with them. And David Rowe has built, a, it's, it's based on an old, old, uh, an old compression scheme called MBE, that's, which stands for multiband excitation. Uh, which is still a source source filter based one. It's operating in the in the frequency domain. So they on the analysis side, you do pitch estimation. You take the uh, you take the FFT to get uh, to to get and try to estimate how much how much periodicity there is in every in, in the bands. So you divide the speech. Uh, speech spectrum into different bands and you decide how much voicing it is. So, so the voicing is not a switch because it's, it could be different voicing, unvoiced and voiced in different bands. That's one of the successes uh, of these. Um, the low bitrate coder started sounding much better if you had mixed excitation with different bands. And then it does an LPC analysis to, to get the spectral shape and quantize per parameters. But the, the interesting thing is then if you look at the uh, the synthesis part, you can see that you take, you, you take the voicing, voicing and <clears throat> to figure out like an excitation. And that's, you, and you go to the in inverse FFT to that. Actually, this becomes, a I see now that this is a time, time, actually a time domain one too, because you, no, you don't. You add, you put the post filter in the FFT domain. Yeah. So you, f you form the source filter uh, in, the, in the frequency domain. So you generate an excitation and then you form, a, you mul multiply within a, like the spectral envelope from these, uh, from the LPC resonances. All right. Let's switch to uh, the most predominantly most used coding scheme called uh, linear predictive coding. Let's. How do I? Oops. Okay. This is based on uh, a mathematical theory and uh, a tool called linear prediction analysis in these let's see let's where is it? sorry <clears throat> this modeling of a signal is that is an all pole filter so the signal is is consisting of a source filter, so the, an excitation, a flat excitation is uh, is driving a of all pole filter. And wh why it's called linear predictive is that uh, the um, it makes a prediction of next sample by taking 
linear combination of pass sample. That's the prediction. And you, so, and the error is the driving excitations. So the, you, get, you get the new samples by the, uh, an incoming sample plus a, a prediction of old samples. And these polynomial coefficients are easily computed. It's a linear uh, equation system. It's the normal equation, the call typically, which includes correlations of the speech. So it's, it's a very powerful and simple tool. It's, there's not much complexity for in, in estimating these uh, polynomials and not very uh, complex to generate the, the speech. So they're, they've been popular since the 50s for, uh, for modeling speech. Okay, how do we do, how do we use this in coding? Yeah, this is a rudimentary LPC vocoder, we can call it like linear predictive vocoder. Uh, like for instance, this principle uh, was used in the federal standard US until 1996. Uh, there is a very common, very well-known uh, vocoder parametric codec called LPC-10 that was standardized by uh, by Department of Defense uh, for a long time ago. But it, it basically looks like this. So you take in, you do a linear prediction analysis, and from and then you do a pitch and voicing analysis from the residual after inverse filtering. Basically, you take the speech and you filter it with uh, multiply with a of z, and then you get the flat residual and from that you, you do an, an a pitch analysis and also making making a, a decision whether it's voiced or not so these coefficients are quantized sent over the channel and used at the decoder and we have an lpc generator here so whether it's voiced or not you you use a pulse generator impulses very simple pulses and or a noise generator and the pitch period the periodicity is controlled by the pitch and then you have a gain and and finally to take the lpc coefficient and in lpc 10 it na it's named 10 because of you take 10 lpc coefficients the polynomial coefficients for for narrowband speech uh, it's uh it's sufficient to have about not, uh, 10, 10 coefficients that gives you uh, it gets you four formants that's eight four formants four resonances and then you get a spectral tilt over the other uh, with the other two a spectral tilt and shape overall shape uh, with so 10 has been sufficient and has been <laughs> it's been used in even today and when you every time you make a cell phone call you're using 10 LPC coefficients in your, in your cell phone. So that's long, long historical uh, led legacy. Come on. All right. Uh, here's another one. This is the most uh, most advanced ones, or actually the uh, the, the ones that are still in use. Uh, the, uh, it's it's the replacement of the LPC-10. In 96, 95, uh, 94 they started. Uh, the American uh, de defense found out that uh, it was really hard to use LPC-10 because it sounded so bad and robotic. So they need something sounding much better at the same low bit rate. So there was a big competition between all the um, major uh, major providers and uh, research labs uh, in 95 and in in the end ti won that competition with their codec called melp which is a mixed excitation linear predictor it said uh, it has some refinements com compared to the lpc 10. it uh, one of the major thing is 
as, as in the uh, multiband expectation, it's that's the mixed excitation. You can have different, different voicing in different bands. So uh, if you look at the here, uh, here is the synthesized part, the synthesizer. So you, you have a noise generator uh, for the unvoiced, but you, you just, you just uh, activate noise in different bands uh, with different gains. That's the shaping filter. And that's, uh, you, have a, you, have a, uh, you have a parameter called the band pass voicing strength. Like, it's like makes the balance between um, voiced and unvoiced. And you transmit, actually you transmit a little bit of the shape of the, of the, of the periodic source with a few Fourier magnitudes of the periodicity, of the periodic uh, excitation. And another thing that's different, yeah, they have some adaptive spectral enhancement, but that's, uh, that's basically also just an LPC synthesis filter. And in the end, they added a pulse dispersion filter, which is an all some kind of phase filter so, to making the uh, periodic sound not sounding so robotic. But this is a, it's a, this is a major upgrade from LPC 10. Uh, it's, uh, and nowadays, it's, I don't know if it's still used, but it is, it is, uh, it, it, I think it is still used for, uh, for, uh, for ham radio and for, for some very low bitrate, uh, uh, secure voice communication. And it operates at 6, 1200 or 2400 bits per second. And uh, hopefully you can listen to it later, but even though it's a major upgrade from the LPC-10, it's still pretty robotic to, to my ears. So what happened <coughs> a bit later after the LPC-10 um, era is that uh, a concept called predict linear predict analysis by synthesis came in to uh, into scope. That is, we actually go back to, to making the, the output looking more or less like the, out, that the, um, like the input. So you, you have a synthesizer, but then you look at the, uh, at the actual waveform and try to match that. So it's, a, it's actually a waveform matching. And sometimes this is called a hybrid because it, it comes from the, like an LPC type of, of coding, but it, it is a waveform matching. So you have an error minimization. You try to match the, the, the waveform. And as done in almost everyone nowadays is that you, tr you do this matching in, the, in a weighted residual domain. So you, took in, you take the LPC analysis and you in, uh, inverse filter the, uh, uh, the speech. And then you have whatever you're using in your, in, in your LPC system as an excitation. You, you have with parameters, you generate that, and then you, um, you shape the error with a weighting filter, uh, which is a combination with a, weighting, a special weighting filter and the LPC synthesis. You do it in this weighted speech domain. So this, this EWN here is in a weighted speech domain that's perceptually uh, good for, for um, important to minimize. So, so when this concept came out, like in the 80s, 82 or something for the first time, uh, this improved the quality in a lot. However, since it's a waveform matching, you actually need to go up in bitrate too. Uh, the major breakthrough came in 85 when Atal and Schroeder introduced what's called this code excited linear prediction, the CELP or the CALP, depending on your flavor of pronouncing it. Uh, that, at that time when it came out, it produced, took like a week on a cray to produce a second of speech or so, because at this time, at, in the 80s, early 80s, this was really, really computationally exp uh, expensive. And the idea is that you have what they call an or LTP filter there, that's a long-term predictor to do the periodicity, to, the, to do the, uh, to get the periodic aspect of it. And then you have an LPC filter to get the long, long uh, the short-term prediction or the spectral shape as before. So you have two, two filters 
you can see that LTP could be as a codebook too, but it doesn't really matter here now. So it's, you have two types of prediction to take care of periodicity and the spectral shape. And then you have a long, long, long table of different excitation sequences, a codebook of, of uh, excitation sequences. And you just try them all and figure out which one is, is the lowest energy, uh, error energy. Uh, and since you have to do an exhaustive search in all these and do a lot of uh, computation of signals here, uh, that was expensive. And it is quite expensive uh, generally, but I think uh, nowadays it's, we have, the, we have the, the power to do that. So this is done today in all cell phones. But then you could go down, you can, you can get from the waveform coder that didn't sound good, like the traditional waveform coder didn't sound good and, and uh, uh, lower than like say 16 kilobits per second. But with the, the cell coder, you can come down to four barely, but like six, seven at least to sounding really good. So, <clears throat> Uh, until, yeah, until a couple of years ago, that was this thing. So we had for internet calls like we have now, we, uh, the voice over IP and, and Skype calls and so on, uh, we uh, have wideband speech. We figured out that that's the most, uh, most pleasant, the best quality. But in order to have it sounding good, you need a high, quite high bit rate compared to the bit rates we're talking about before. So it typically, and like here now, in this call, we're using, this is Zoom, right? And Zoom is using Opus, and Opus is probably running at, I would say 32, 24 kilobits per second. Right now, my voice is coming to your ears, transmitted as maybe, maybe 32 kilobits per second. Uh, and these codecs they are all waveform matching. And they go very, they sound really crappy at low rates. They go sounding harsh and noisy. However, now in the emergence of uh, internet everywhere, uh, people want to use uh, the phones for comp uh, to not to speak as a cell phone. They use the phone to do VoIP calls like Skype calls or Zoom calls even uh, when there are poor networks. So there is a need to do internet calls using a low bit rate. So reducing the bit rate has suddenly becoming important again. And that's why I feel that when, when it's in the beginning, uh, because uh, speech coding uh, hasn't been, it's kind of been dead, like especially low bit rate coding has been dead in, research wise uh, since the 90s. So, but now it comes back again How, because. Yeah, Jan, is it also true that uh, for not only for speech, but also for music, for audio in general, coding, uh, people um, restarted to look at the issue and. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, but for, uh, yeah, and for audio, uh, yeah, audio can't really rely on, there are no good audio codecs relying on models, uh, I think. Um, I, and now that all, all audio coders in the end of the day are kind of waveform matching ones. So even for high, uh, for, for uh, they clearly don't sound good uh, until like 30, even for stereo coding, like 30, 40, maybe. Uh, but yeah, there is an there is an interest now to even look for for audio coders like waveform wave wave matching coders to go down in in bit rate. Uh, that's a topic for another talk, which I maybe okay. come come back to talk about. <laughs> uh, but here I'm here I'm talking about speech codecs and very low rates. So uh, for instance, uh, I can take an example of. Uh, Duo, which is a codec, it's just a, uh, uh, an app that Google and I've been involved with. Uh, people are using Duo calls, even in really extreme uh, conditions. Uh, even though you have a good phone, the networks are problematic 
So people have good phones, but and people get more and phones get cheaper and more and more advanced, but the infrastructure is not. So uh, in some emerging markets, uh, uh, I don't know if it was India or Indonesia or one one of those two, uh, they met, saw that people were using uh, really old uh, 2G networks, like you know uh, GSM networks, to try to make VoIP calls. And in those in those networks, you, the bandwidth you have available to do coding is around five kilobits per second and you can't do it but, but there is a need so so that's why uh, we're starting looking into this again and but at lower than five that is uh, like a round number uh, the only things available that sounds okay is uh, parametric coders but they sound really bad they, they sound better than waveform coders but it still pretty bad so what can we do now uh, knowing what we can know yeah but then we realized or people realized wait a minute the the parametric coder yeah they what what are they yeah they they have a, a speech synthesizer at the decoder they're driven by parameter parameters but so you just need a generative model are there better generative model today than for 20 years ago yeah that's uh, what I think we have. So that's a segue to the next session, uh, next section. What uh, are people still up for continuing or should we take a break? You can, you can it's up to you. I think it's uh, probably a good yeah. I'll uh, make some coffee. time not to take a break and, and ask questions if people have questions. And then, yes, yes, yes. Uh, that was a nice, you know, uh, we so quickly so many years of uh, speech coding and so i don't know probably people have do you have any questions yeah it's up to you uh jan yeah yeah no i i i gladly take as i said i think we have we're halfway there okay. but and uh, so, uh only one hour <laughs> yeah 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 so uh, it's okay um if there are no other questions, you can we we can take a break. Yep. And then uh, we can pause this recording. See if us please pause it, and then uh, come back. You can turn off your video, for instance, your audio. Uh, relax a bit, and then come back. Yep. Say it like take it to ten or something. Yeah, yeah. That's fine. Okay. All right. Yep. Okay. I hope. I hope I uh, still have some people. I still people are connected. I don't, I'm not really sure how. Yeah, yeah, they are connected. Uh, can you check also since you are the host? Can you yes. check if there are people that you need to admit? Again, it's too late for uh, for East from where we have many, many participants. I know, I know. So I, I'm just happy that someone, that some people are still online. Uh, it's uh, time zones, uh, I think they're, they're a nuisance. That I, I, I realize that too. I, I try to be kind of agnostic, uh, but my, my body doesn't really uh, comply with that because it's sometimes really hard to stay up after when traveling, whenever you, wherever yeah. you are. And it's getting worse. I think it's getting worse uh, by age, unfortunately. <clears throat> Come on. <laughs> I have a friend though. He uh, he has a superpower. He, he says like like uh, uh, for me, time zones are irrelevant. You can call me anytime, anywhere. <laughs> yeah, it's okay, but he. I, I guess he doesn't have such nice color hair as you do. <laughs> So you cannot be perfect, you see? <laughs> no one is perfect. No. No. <laughs> okay, so it's All right, up to you. So let's, you uh, yeah, so let's go venture into actually the topic of the entire talk. But I felt like you needed a proper introduction to get perspective of what we're doing. So let's go to the, uh, the state of the arts in 
in the sense that I don't know there are no there are no systems uh, uh, deployed yet, but there are active research going on, both in universities and at co companies using using this new technology for for low bitrate speech compression. All right. Uh, to start off, uh, I think many of you have seen this kind of taxonomy before, and then I, since I unfortunately didn't see any of the other talks, there are many, uh, many ways of uh, doing generative synthesis. And these, these methods can be classified differently. And I think this was Ian Goodfellas who did this the first time. Uh, of these parametric models that are based on maximum likelihood as the uh, as the goodness met metric when when you're uh, doing this generative synthesis a generative synthesis in the sense that you're trying to uh, directly or or indirectly figure out a, a probability density function and draw samples from that and that those samples are your 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 waveform, or in this case, uh, and he he kind of classified it is as you do a uh, maximum likely, uh, and you, you know for any kind of maximum likely, you you need a PDF and a distribution, and uh, that th this distribution can be explicit, so there is a, a real distribution, or it could be in, in, implicit in the sense that you have really it's you never actually use the distribution, it's in there somewhere. And the the GANs are in that class. And I'm not going to talk about that. Hopefully, someone else else has. Uh, it's yet to be, to my knowledge, to be used for compression. Uh, but if we have an ex explicit distribution, you can have <clears throat> uh, you can you can have a real distribution that's tractable that you can that's uh, there is a, a real tangible distribution that you can tractable so that you can operate on it and derive something from it or you can approximate it so because you can't really treat it so you do it approximation you can have these are all the variational methods the variational autoencoders uh, and and to my knowledge there is no either no variational autoencoders for for speech coding there are autoencoders for speech coding. They are more waveform matching type. And so far, uh, they've been doing higher bit rates. And the, common, or the current state is that most of these systems, they're really cool. Uh, but they are, uh, quality-wise, they are on par with traditional methods. Uh, and we hope that research will make these waveform coders uh, or the autoencoding uh, brand of or type of uh, co codex. Minja um, Jim in Indiana, uh, his his team, they're working on this uh, intensively, and and uh, I'm I'm rooting for them to make a good way uh, waveform audio coding uh, that uh, in that <coughs> in that direction. Uh, but that's not what I'm doing, <laughs> and we're talking about here. So here we're talking about tractable distributions that we can we can put up a we can actually get a expression for the or for the PDF and try to optimize its its parameters. And all the autoregressive ones uh, can be in here. Uh, and again, I know that you talked about WaveNet and WaveRNN and sample RNN. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that. And I don't think it's, okay. I think it's okay to do it again because repetition is always good. And I'm going to look at it from my speech coding background. And uh, this is something, I come from a speech coding DSP, really trying um, these uh, uh, audio signal processing where we have mathematical models, we estimate, we have models for all the signals ones and just, Recently, like the last five ten years, came into this uh, these notions about neural networks and black box and modeling. So uh, I'm I'm still going to use um, and that's I think it's a this is could be a strength could be a, uh, an imp impediment uh, impediment I guess for some sometimes that you're still thinking in this signal processing vein. 
that's why I surround myself with a lot of people that are good in in uh, in machine learning. So we give and take. And again, maybe this is an, uh, a repetition, but we have we try to model a distribution of data. That's that's. Uh, a little bit different actually from this the standard signal processing way where we, we yeah we sometimes model distributions uh, for features and so on but uh, we don't rarely sample this distribution f to get the audio examples but this is a kind of a novel thing for for us from this uh, this old school of, of thinking so we have the signal samples uh, and this is the samples of the distribution. So it's, it's two types of samples, samples from a PDF and audio samples. So it's kind of tricky to mean what I'm, but the, the uh, I sometimes mean the samples of the audio samples, sometimes mean PDF samples, but we have at least this set of samples and they all belong to this P data as the, uh, the uh, probability of density function. We want to fit, we want to find a model so that this data model is, uh, data is resembling the model. The PDF of the true data is resembling that PDF of the model that we just uh, devised or trying to uh, fit. And that's also not new. Uh, we, there are these, per, these parameters uh, for the models have been for speech, for speech samples, there, for instance, Laplacian uh, distribution has been. If you just look at speech samples uh, as a memoryless source, source, we know, of course, that the if you look at two samples, uh, speech samples, they are highly correlated. And but if you don't just look at them as if you just randomize all the samples and don't look at these uh, the correlation and so on, and to look at the distribution, they all they look very similar to Laplacian distribution. And similarly, if you look at the DFT of the, F, the FFT, if you look at the DFT coefficients, uh, the complex or in, in, in the imaginary or, um, uh, or the uh, real values, just look at them in uh, memoryless and plot the histograms. They, they're very, very often similar uh, to a Gaussian. So, so that's been modeled before in noise and uh, speech enhancement and noise suppression and so on for the actual samples. Uh, let's see what, did, uh, sorry, no, 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 no. Uh, let's see, how can I go a gap? I missed the, uh, the cursor. Oh, um. Okay. Uh, the cursor when I do when I do full screen, I'm, I'm, my cursor is gone. Uh, mm. But it's it's fine. That that is for Keynote probably. Yeah, it's Keynote. Uh, anyways, I I, I I I don't need it. Okay. But these. Uh, Okay, all these man-made ones, I mean, we, we're limited in the sense that, yeah, this, this it has a few parameters and they can't mix, they can't model anything. Of course, there are some of them, like like mixture of logistics, mixture of Gaussians and so on, that has a little bit more uh, freedom in, in their express, expressivity, but expressivity. But it's still kind of, parametric and there's limits. You want to be completely free. And that's what these deep model, uh, they remove this, this constraint. You can basically model anything with them. And, and you don't really need the parameters as long as you have uh, like an, a network that can just do it implicitly in the box. So that, that's kind of the strength. So if you look at the ones that we're using mostly here uh, is the uh, autoregressive models. And it all, all is based on that uh, we can we can just factorize this big uh, 
multi-dimensional for a for a frame or for a long sequence of samples uh, we of, of speech data we we can model this as a just a just a factor of conditional probabilities and if we look at these individual ones that you can see that this q of xk so for each individual sample it's it's a function of all samples so we can predict the next sample just given all the previous samples so we it's very simple you, you it's one dimensional uh, probability density function that's kind of the key f for using this uh, some people will uh, like with with uh, with with good cause you say yeah that's also also uh, a drawback because you need to get sample it sample by sample uh, which can make, can make it a little bit complex but it's it's makes it so simple in, in its in its its raw form so you just look at you have complete we have a tractable explicit likelihood here so the probability function and you can you can easily draw a sample from this because you can just uh, you, you have you have you can you can model it so, and do a random n number from it, but it also gives an explicit probability per sample, given the old samples. So that's this is what I feel is kind of the key and uh, the elegant thing of looking at it. Why why we, why we can do what we're doing in auto regressive models. And again, uh, if you have questions, but I know it's late, but you can just jump in with questions whenever because this is. Uh, this, is, this is not a real lecture. This is a laid, laid back uh, session, I hope. So, and I guess again, WaveNet, you talked about that earlier, and there is no talk with, on, on WaveNet there, whatsoever where you, ha you can't, you must use this moving image. So this animation is in all my presentation of WaveNet and every presentation I know people from DeepMind when they're used, talking about WaveNet. It's very beautiful. So uh, it, it says something about dilated convolution. It's, um, it's also a little hard to, if, because this, these are not nodes, it's like typically when you draw a neural network, these are more how the samples are, are related insides. Not the real samples, but the, the sample probabilities inside the network and so it's auto regressive you, you would when you t you generate the sample and then you put put that back and it's also and one thing that i feel is is interesting with this picture from a signal processing background is that it very much looks like an fir filter it's a convolutional filter um, network that takes all Unless, I mean, you can see it recursive in the sense that you put it back, but to produce one sample, you, you uh, from below, you just m took, take everything you have, or for a certain, uh, certain window in, in back in time, you use that data to, to nonlinearly form, uh, a nonlinear filter, you can call it, like so, so that you generate the sample. And here again, I think you've seen this picture uh, inside WaveNet architecture. Uh, the the actual computations that are done inside. It's 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 a co uh, convolutional network with skip connections, and where you form uh, in the original WaveNet, you have a soft max for two fifty six probabilities of each of a sample of uh, eight bit 256 levels like the eight bit uh, probabilities of value of a, of, a, of a audio audio value and the thing the way I print yeah, the way it's displayed here and it's this nice animation is that it's all completely auto regressive uh, there's no control of it so if you run a system like this it will just produce, produce random speech sound, basically babble, which is 
yeah, as an art form, it sounds pretty cool, but it's not useful. In order to drive it, to control the network, you need conditioning. And uh, that's very often omitted in the WaveNet presentations, but any kind of usefulness you need in with, uh, the probability density function, the Q here, the blue one here, you need another uh, conditioning here. You could have to condition on some parameter, conditioning features to control what, it, what this next uh, sound would be. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about a parametric speech codec that's using WaveNet uh, for its synthesis part. Uh, it was presented at ICASP a couple of years ago. And to my knowledge, it was the first one to kind of use autoregressive network for low bitrate coding. And again, this is typically how you train WaveNet or how WaveNet is is used in reality when you have a uh, when you have a conditioning. Here, the generative model has is conditioned on some features. Besides, it's not here in this PX here. Of course, it's it's um, it's auto regressive, so it's not only so this X here can be uh, described as an a a scalar one, so it's uh, just one dimensional uh, with the conditioning and all the past samples. So when you train it, you do feature extraction, some kind of features, uh, I guess for TTS is text or phonemes or and pitch and stuff. Uh, and then you put these conditioning features into the WaveNet and then you compare it during training with the uh, Oh, yeah, the, the clean speech, that's the targets. And when you, and then you so-called teacher force it to during training to, to, because the, uh, you put the clean speech into the pipeline during training and minimize uh, the parameters to, to make the outputs as soon uh, as, uh, as close as possible. Not that you don't actually sample it, but you make the, the, uh, probability of the true sample be as possible as possible uh, as, as, as cl close as possible but you all know that you've been training uh, wavenet so what in the coding thing when we're going to use the same we're going to use exactly the same thing so it, we're going to drive wavenet with not tts parameters but we're going to we're going to drive it with uh, speech coding uh, parameters and what we in this first uh, project we did here we took a it's the codec 2 which uh, said before was is an uh, open source code uh, open source traditional uh, for coder parametric parameter I think it's very nice because it in the sense that it's open source and it's it's very easy to understand straightforward um, uh, parameters uh, it's a narrowband codec so it's, uh, it's, it's so narrowband meaning that it's sample at eight kilohertz, meaning the signal contents is only up to four kilohertz. Uh, the parameters it uses, we can maybe go back. Actually, we can do that. Uh, how do you go back? Yeah, let's go, let's go back and look at the, can do the codec two, yeah. So the parameters, for codec two is the uh, LPC coefficient. They are they are coded as line spectral pair, the line spectral frequency, which is another representation of the polynomial coefficient. Very very good for quantization because they can guarantee that the polynomial uh, is stable, uh, which is good in reality. So because you 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 uh, in in a, in a here we don't really care for for wavenet but for for a for coder where you actually f put the um, the filter in uh, one over a of z it's good if it's stable otherwise it will uh, maybe make your ear bleed 
Anyways, so the LSP and when the energy, the, L, the light spectral frequencies, energy, and uh, a voicing. It's just one parameter for voicing. So that's what we use as condition features. So, and these we just fed into a wave net. These are quantized uh, at, and at 24 kilobits per second. So, so if you're going to use this after training, we use this as a as a speech coder. We take this, we take the clean wideband speech. Uh, the codec itself is narrow band, so we have to we have to downsample and it limits its bandwidth to four kilohertz. Transmit these uh, quantized uh, parameters at 2.4 kilobits per second. We uh, then we use this to drive WaveNet as, as, as the conditioning. And the output speech is actually back because we trained it to. We trained it to uh, generate 16 kilohertz wideband samples. And that's the output of, of the codec. And this is just some data for what we for this, this is as a codec then. We uh, just repeat what I said. Let's take the parameters from codec 2. They are all narrow band, but the output is wide band. And for, for the Ycast paper, we trained this on Wall Street Journal. We, we said, so we had 123 speakers and we had eight, we did a disjunct test with eight speakers. So I think that's also kind of um, important to notice for Prior to this work, uh, the WaveNet for TTS, they are all trained for a one voice uh, or a sing single voice, although there are like multiple voices. Uh, so, the, uh, so when you generate speech, you typically in TTS, use, you generate with the same speaker that you, that you train for. And when Aaron talked about using his WaveNet, uh, the WaveNet, uh, a long time ago, for for when he also uh, the, the DeepMind people always, uh, also said, of course, in one of the applications would be compression. Uh, they always said that yeah, but then you need to send speaker ID as a feature as a uh, as a conditioning feature. That doesn't really fly in a general uh, like telephony system that you, know, you can't uh, you you need to have an unknown speaker sounding good too. Uh, or maybe of course, if you put a, if you make a register with all the speakers in the world, and, and of course then you just have, you need a few bits to, to send, a, but you need to store these and you did train for all of these. So it, it's of course not, not very feasible. So well, that was the one thing that we were kind of uh, worried about, like, oh, does it generalize? Can, can we actually code? Can we train for many speakers and then code on other speakers? Uh, so that was, was uh, about to be seen, whether it generalizes. And <clears throat> this, this is also based on the first uh, WaveNet that used 8-bit MULA, so it's the, so it has, limited resolution in the audio uh, audio um, values and the audio samples. It's 8-bit MULA, uh, which is the standard for telephony at uh, in landline. And we look back, we send at 100 hertz, what is that, it's 10 milliseconds, uh, update rate and look back 300 milliseconds to do that and one thing that is cool with this then is that we we can get automatic bandwidth extension uh, we don't transmit anything information any information above four kilohertz because the codec does not have that uh, but the cool thing is that the wavenet has learned to use these features to regenerate the upper frequencies. So here you can see what happens with a wideband original and the codec 2, this is the codec 2 synthesis of it. So the, the codec 2 parameters in, in themselves 
using their uh, uh, codec two synthesis will not generate anything higher than four, but the WaveNet generator can get recreate these fricatives there. You see at like one the point three seconds there. That that information is completely gone. Now actually, there is one at point seven there. Yeah, what happens there? There's there there is some errors there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah, that's also what happens. So it doesn't really know. It can do, and it's all probabilistic. So it actually can guess wrong sometimes because it has to fill up. Uh, fill, you have to fill out the in, in in paint the upper band, and then of course you can't always get correct. So sometimes it it adds da uh, data like it, that 0.7 seconds there that was not there in the original, and that could actually be heard sometimes that there is some phonem errors that it uh, adds it kind of recreates the wrong wrong sound. Uh, hello, hello, Jan. Hello. Yes. Yes. So, so there's someone in the waiting room. Can you please uh, let her in? Because she, How I do think I do that? that? Let's see. I, I don't see it. Let's see. If I do this. Uh, no, you. Oh, yes. In the participants. Okay. Let's see. Oh, uh, I see now. I see. I so sorry. Admit, admit. Oh, yes, yeah, I can yeah. do that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry yeah. for the interruption. No, no, that's good. Yeah. I, I learn new things every day. This is the first time I'm using this pro uh, this program. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So how does this sound? Uh, I, soon I'll, I'm going to let, let you listen to it but typically and uh, speech enhancement and speech coding you you uh, you report numbers uh, of objective metrics and these objective metrics are supposedly be uh, supposedly uh, verified to be uh, correlated with the subjective impression and for speech uh, the used to be PESC that has been replaced with polka, uh, which is apparently better. And polka is really good in uh, for waveform matching coders to, to in the sense that it uh, correlates with the quality with equality. But for uh, generative synthesis, even low bit rates, uh, even vocoders, it's not really suited because the the waveform is comp so completely different that the uh, the, f the models in this uh, in these uh, objective metrics fail so the only thing okay we know because we have listened to it we know that the uh, the wavenet codecs sound pretty good and you'll see in in the in subjective course but using polka you see here that uh, okay. So the rate here is the bit rate. <clears throat> We're comparing with some others too. So this uh, we have MELP that I talked about before. It's also at two point four, and then we have mutilated speaks. Speaks is a kelp, uh, an open source kelp coder. Uh, so it's a waveform matching coder, but you can actually drive it down to two point four. Uh, it's not recommended to go below four or five because it sounds really bad. But we needed yeah, just to, to make an example to show, show how, how it sounds. We also have like state of the art uh, wideband coding, which is AMR wideband. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's also a standardized uh, rate. So that, at, but that is driven at uh, 23 kilobits per second. And we all, uh, this WW is if we take uh, just uh, if you do uh, complete waveform matching of our coder and just use the uh, uh, use the probabilities not for generating signals just for generating uh, an entropy coder. So you can entropy coding. You can use the entropy, entropy to entropy code uh, the original or the MULA. 
and that will be around 40 kilobits per second. That's that's perfect record. No, not perfect record. That's Mueller reconstruction. And the MOS scores from this polka, which is a goodness measure, from one to five, or actually MOS doesn't go more than 4.9 uh, in, in polka. I don't know. Maximum in polka, I think, is like 4.9 or something. So uh, these, uh, according to, to polka, uh, our codec is as good as MELP. Uh, which which uh, I'll, I'll, I'll are you gonna i hope that you will agree when you listen to it it's not really true so these what i want to say is that the, the, these uh, objective metrics for generative synthesis uh, you can just throw them out of the window because they they don't they don't we need we need a good better metric objective metric for these kind of systems because this does not reflect reality on the other hand Listening test is the only way to do it. And I think that's in general, even from the speech enhancement and all that. You, you, it's good to have some objective metrics like SNRs and, and, and PESC and so on. But in the end of the day, these are used, the, 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 our ears and brains are the final judge. So you need, when you do, I think that's for anyone here that does TTS too. In the end of the day, you need to do a subjective test. You have to figure out how it sounds because that's what matters in the end not objective metrics. So we did uh, a Mushra test. It's not really Mushra because we didn't have, uh, formally in Mushra you need a, a, an anchor, which a low pass signal. And, but since we have, uh, we have narrow low pass signal in a narrow band codex, our, uh, uh, just a low pass signal would sound pretty good because it's basically uh, what, a perfect melt will sound like, but because uh, because of that, we we we, we introduce the speak series, kind of the, the worst. Like when when you do this, you need a, an anchor to kind of spread out the curve. So we that's why I call it mushro esque because it doesn't have a proper anchor, but we have a more uh, relevant anchor the speaks here because that's really terrible. So you can see <laughs> uh, here the listening results listening test and the original and because people couldn't really uh, uh, sometimes people can't really hear the difference that's why it got, goes down there a little bit but uh, the mu law is is called uh, mu law it's ww here uh, that's so that's that's eight bit it's 128 120, the MULA itself will be 128 kilobits a second using entropy coding, uh, which is a, uh, a, um, lossless, a lossless coder. On top of that, we get to 42 kilobits per second. Uh, that's kind of uh, what we strive for. AMR wideband uh, is a good codec. It comes up there pretty high but that's at the bit rate at 23 kilobits per second. So if you look at the low bit rate codecs here, the really low bit rates, and we have a MELP and codec two for comparisons and speaks for like an anchor. So, uh, and here you can also see that speaks is a way for matching one. It's a, it's a Kelp coder. At 2.4, it's really bad compared to parametric coder. So MELP, both MELP and codec two are better than speaks and MELP is slightly better. Uh, we use Codec2 because it was publicly available and uh, open source and other people will use it. So the interesting thing here is that our WaveNet codec WP here, uh, it's up there. It's not as good as AMR wideband, but it's pretty high up there. And if you compare to Codec2, again, we have the same encoder. It's just that we use the WaveNet as a synthesizer and Codec2 has its own generative synthesis and uh, this uh, is basically our, we were pretty happy with this result now let's see what happens let I do stop share demo share share screen
Wood. I can. Share screen. Oops. Sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah, here it is. Found it. Sorry. No? You have to bear with me. Um, here it is. No, here it is. Okay. Do you see this one with the demos? Yes. Okay. All right. Let's first hear uh, the original of, of one male. Separately, New York State sold about $77.1 million of certificates of participation. And uh, so that's 16-bit uh, PCM. And here is 8-bit MULA from that. That's where we base everything on. This is kind of our ground truth. Separately, New York State sold about $77.1 million of certificates of participation. Yeah. That's, all right. Here is, let's go, how bad you can go, or let's go AMR wideband. Separately, New York State sold about $77.1 million of certificates of participation. Okay. Let's go down from the other side. So, speaks. Separately, New York State sold about $77.1 million of certificates of participation. Yep, that's 2.4 kilobits per second. Here's MALP. Separately, New York State sold about $77.1 million of certificates of participation. And Codec 2. Separately, New York State sold about $77.1 million of certificates of participation. Okay, now we take the same same bitstream over the channel and you drive WaveNet. Listen to this again. Separately, New York State sold about $77.1 million of certificates of participation. Separately, New York State sold about $77.1 million of certificates of participation. So, and the other one. In the efforts to restore market confidence, administration officials have emphasized that the economy's fundamentals remain sound. In the efforts to restore market confidence, administration officials have emphasized that the economy's fundamentals remain sound. And I am more wideband to compare to. In the efforts to restore market confidence, administration officials have emphasized that the economy's fundamentals remain sound. Okay, any questions about that? Uh, yeah. Uh, hello, Jan. Uh, yes. One more thing, I think there are people still in the waiting room. Can you please okay. let them in? Uh, participants. Now I know how to do it, so it's easy. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> right, so I had a question about that. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, all right, so these speakers are unseen speakers, right? Yeah, yeah okay, thank you. It sounds pretty good. Yeah, uh, they're, they are taken from the same database, though. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but it's just a caveat because I, you have to be... Uh, a little bit critical, yeah, always, but uh, they, yeah, so it's from Wall Street Journal. So they different speakers, uh, completely different speakers, different uh, recordings, but it's recorded in the same way. So it's the same type of microphones and studio recordings. And in the, the text they read is similar too. So kind of uh, prosody and all that could be the same. But that being said, yeah, it, given this very good circumstances, I think it's, it's pretty good. This is kind of okay. what drove us to continue in this field and others to continue in this field. So did you try it with uh, other recording conditions? Uh, let me talk about that a bit later. Okay, thank you. <laughs> oh, any more questions? Uh, we have, we have a long day. 
All right, then I'll go, go back to the presentation. Okay, I think the question I got here was a really good one. It was per perfectly synced with my next slide here. That, so okay, so we were really happy with these results and other were uh, too. Uh, so, so let's build a practical speech coder and put it in a phone. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> WaveNet uh, original one that we used. This is not uh, the way that we used for this was uh, not the not the open source one. This was Deep Minds, and of course, Deep Minds own proprietary one is the best one I've ever heard. And uh, there are some secret sauce in there that I don't know about, but but it sounds much better than any any other implementation I've heard. So we used theirs and drive drove it with our own uh, conditioning, and we had to hack the code so on. But but anyways, it, it's it's the best implementation of WaveNet I know. It's extremely complex. Um, so you can't really, and even in, in the, um, the, the ones that are implemented independently, you can't really d uh, get a complexity low enough to, to run it in real time on any, I don't even with GPUs. Uh, I'm not sure, but I, I'm pretty sure actually. I just can't do it. So WaveNet is a good way to kind of see how good you can get with the system. And hopefully one day we have the computing power or someone is clever enough in making something as good as WaveNet, but less, less complex. And people have done that, tried to reduce the complexity of WaveNet. Uh, so DeepMind guys came up with a parallel wave, wave net and where you just still a, like a smaller, you train a big one and, and you just still a smaller one that you can use. Uh, you might have talked about that. I saw that in the, in the, in the uh, chat room that maybe someone talked about earlier. Another one is WaveRNN also from DeepMind uh, and sample RNN. These are replacing the convolutional big FIR filter with an IIR filter, is the, uh, but in, the, in my mind of thinking it, recursive net instead of a con convoluted net. Uh, so the complexity is one major thing. Uh, it's, it's, if you want to build a practical one, you have, you have to run it in real time, uh, interactively on both sides. Uh, another thing that you need to have in, in a practical situation is that you never have, uh, very, very rarely you have clean, uh, studio quality speech so you may be able to you have to uh, cope with background noise uh, that's one thing and on the recording chain because like on a, especially on a phone you have you have the you, you have the microphone and non-linearities in the, in the clipping and stuff uh, so that comes from the hardware and different processing things so recording chain is a factor and then of course as, as we did here, we have multiple talkers and languages. Uh, we show that the multiple talkers are not as big issue. Uh, languages, uh, I, I've seen languages could be a problem, but mostly, yeah, it's it's you need to you need to figure out how to cope with different talk, talkers, different pitch, uh, especially the prosody and, and pitch structures uh, is problematic, and sometimes it can't really cover that. Uh, so, and I'm from, from, from now on, because this was like the first pilot experiments we did, like how, how, well, how well can you do? And like, like this, is, this is kind of like what we strive for. And if we want to make something usable, we have to address others, other problems. So, and, and as, as is, since I have it here, we can look, listen to what happened to, if you try to code something that's not, perfect clean speech so stop share again i'm going to do go here so us and then share screen i'm becoming a really good on this now all right do you see wavenet conditioning features from noisy audio and can you see this yes, yes. okay all right 
let's do the first example. Uh, we have a regular, okay, this is an extreme example, but this can happen, right? When you have a phone call and you're sitting home in, in, in COVID-19 and, you, and, COVID and you're having, a, you're having a, a video chat like that today. This, this can, sound, it can sound like this if you're sitting in a living room. At NEC, the need for international managers will keep rising. This is an artificial example because <clears throat> typically you don't sit and read Wall Street Journal like that. Uh, but this is an artificial example. Uh, nevertheless, it's pretty hard to let's let's listen to it again and see what happens when uh, when our WaveNet codec. At NEC, the need for international managers will keep rising. Since WaveNet codec can only do clean speech, it's try to match this input to with, with clean speech. Try it again. So that didn't go so well. All right, and this, now we have an extreme example because this, there is no clean speech here whatsoever. It's pure music. get the drift and this is how wavenet coding tries to mimic this Did that answer your questions, how it sounds with other kind of recordings? Yeah, thank you. It's amazing. Yeah, you loved it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it, it's, it is what it is. I mean, you get what you, uh, you, get what you wish for. It's a, it's a fantastic speech synthesizer for clean speech. And it can, it can extract pitch and voicing for speech sounds. Try to get the speech pitch from a multi-pitched orchestra will fail and it will and the same with background noise yeah, so that is a big problem uh, so there is something remaining in what it we before we can put it in the phone um, hi so I have a question yeah uh, so first of all this maybe you got a converter between classical and contemporary music, right? <laughs> this is what yeah. it's doing <laughs> now um, uh, but uh, I want to ask so this so have you tried uh, changing the database, like adding noise or? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, in a few slides. Ah, OK. <laughs> um, and then just another quick one. So you sure. said um, uh, low complexity, of course, is also a, a specific, right? And, yeah. you, and you cited some other lower complexity, let's say, models. Yeah. But aren't those still a couple of order of magnitudes away from a yeah. target? Yeah, okay. Yeah, they are. Okay. For instance, sample RNN uh, is still, yeah, I'll talk. Yeah, you're right. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, so I'm going to first talk a little bit about like trying to get rid of the complexity, you get lower the complexity. And then in the end, talk about how can we try to get it more ro robust to background noise. So, so like, like the question, excellent question asked, some of these are, uh, are lower than WaveNet, but still pretty high. And one of them is, for instance, is sample RNN. Uh, so that's been used for coding. The guys at Dolby did this uh, last year. Uh, it's lower complexity than WaveNet, uh, but they did not try to make it real time. They they also they just uh, they just examined another type of architecture than we did, 
they, they did so they had a sample RNN and what they did more that so in there our sample RNN is like a layered a hierarchical uh, you, so it's kind of a learned down sampling uh, or up sampling in this case or depending on you see it uh, different time scales and different layers and to gen to generate uh, the uh, so it's one it's one RNN in each tier. So it's like three grooves here, and there are, could could be big ones. And the interesting here com compared to what we used, uh, they used a traditional LPC vocoder parameters, and not the codec two. But they showed it was similar. You can use you can use any kind of parameters to drive a a, a generative net. So I think it's, this is a pretty neat work. Uh, with this model, since they have this, a um, good thing with, with this codec, I think, is that since they have this time scale or this hierarchical one, they can scale it too in different bit rates. So they can actually make it sound better at higher bit rates. So they can come up to like three, like four, eight kilohertz, uh, kilobits per second, sounding uh, a little bit better uh, than what we could, what, what WaveNet thing can do. Um, so that, that's kind of uh, one of the uh, advantages of using uh, the sample RNN because you can do this different, you, know, you can scale it a little bit. Anyways, uh, it's still too it's still too complex. Even though, and, and uh, kudos to the authors, they did not address the complexity here. It's more than making a more versatile codec. So it's still too complex. So. Uh, wave RNN uh, was, uh, I think you talked about that too, but the Wave RNN does uh, uh, lend itself to lower complexity though. You, you can drive it pretty low and they show the original uh, Wave RNN paper that it can, can go really low but with, without losing too much uh, quality. You will lose quality. Uh, it's unfortunate, I, I, I tried the best Wave RNN and the best wave net you you can unfortunately never come up to exactly the same quality but close uh, and so in in wave rnn you, you replace the entire con convolutional net with one single one single groove which is complexity um, reduction compared to sample rnn and another thing thing to get the complexity down is to have like sparse weight matrices so you you can many of these multiplications will be zero, so you can omit them. And uh, also you don't have to store them. But the quality improvements here is that they went from 8 bits to 16-bit. To and the way the representation with the softmax, uh, I was in WaveNet, we have like softmax for all the 256 levels. If you want to do 16-bit resolution, it's infeasible to have. Unfortunately, it was like 65, a histogram with 65,000 bins. Uh, it's, it's a little bit too complex. So they split it up in, in, in cores and fine parts. So they, they do softmax for, for fine quantization and for coarse quantization. Uh, so uh, I don't know if we need to go into the update equations, but I, I, if I look, just look at the, uh, if, if, if we just disregard uh, and also, unfortunately, in their paper, in the original Wave RNN paper, they in the in the equations there is no mentioning of uh, of conditioning, uh, which is of course in reality a need. So, in in my in my equation here, I actually see the input vector is the old old data, but also a feature, it's also a feature condition in there, and. <coughs> So uh, that that gets you pretty pretty far actually in its, in its general form here. This this can get you very low in complexity. But uh, the next so now we're finding the next next uh, topic will be uh, about one of another things that I was involved with called LPC net, which, which takes the complexity down to real time operation on. On an Android phone and, and an iPhone, and but you need so you need but you need to do more a little bit more than WaveRNN. So in LPC net, 
we go back to LPC predictive coding thinking again. Uh, we know from all past experience uh, since the 80s, 50s, that you can easily, with 10 coefficients in LPC 10, maybe more uh, when you do wideband, but you can easily model the, the spectral envelope uh, of speech by linear prediction, just taking linear combination of the old samples. And you, you, so you don't need to, you need, you don't need to spend uh, expensive neurons on trying to, to, uh, to model the spectral envelope. So in, in LPC net, we do that ourselves. Let's let signal processing take care of that, simple, and let the network focus on generating the excitation in LPC based thinking in a source filter. Just, just to wave RNN on the residual or the excitation or linear prediction yeah, residual basically. And that was presented at ICASP a couple of years ago, but I, I don't know if anyone earlier this week talked about it. But this uh, has had some reson resonance in the literature and pe people have used it. Uh, and uh, I've heard people using it for TTS and it sounds pretty good. So it works. Uh, we're gonna use it for coding in later on here, but for even for, for a TTS, it works fine. So b besides lifting out the spectral modeling, the spectral envelope modeling, we put in some other things to, uh, to make it sound better and an another thing to make it easier to, um, for a little, uh, so okay, so we we'll put pre-emphasis. Pre-emphasis has also been done in, in speech analysis to flatten the, uh, the spectral tilt uh, which is good for the LPC to actually for, uh, track the formants and not the tilt itself, because that we can easily just flip it up. And you can do that, uh, you can do it uh, adaptively, uh, but it's, you can also just do it fixed, hard. So, because in general, uh, all vowels have a slope that's, and you can just take an average slope out of everything. What that what happens then is that you emphasize the higher frequencies. So when you, that has uh, the advantage of making a better fit on a, on a, on a pre-emphasized speech. So when you go back to the speech domain, uh, you low pass filter it a little bit, which means that the, the noise that you add due to uh, the eight bit mu law representation we noise shape that a little bit uh, so that it's it's reduced in the higher frequencies, and that's actually audible. Uh, it's uh, it's it's a bit. It's a, uh, I I felt that that was a good 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 improvement. Then another thing that is in here that's an improvement that's a little bit of uh, computational ones. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's instead of uh, so we do an input embedding instead of trying to predict the actual. Mueller values or represent them. Uh, the uh, in, input input is embedded so that you can pre-compute the matrix products. It's just a simplification to make it faster. And on, uh, actually, in, on, uh, the bonus is that you actually let the uh, since you have this embedding, uh, the the network will learn the Mueller. Uh, linear function a little bit. So, and here is the system. Uh, it's to, it's based on two 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 networks. The the wave RNN standard wave RNN, but it's been <coughs> it's been simplified. Uh, so. <coughs> It's conditioned, first of all, like, and that we have a sample rate for network that generates a sample, uh, the output audio, and then we have a frame rate network for the conditioning. So it operates one at a frame, at, at a frame basis. So for each speech frame, each speech segment, it's, it's generating 
feature vector a feature vector constant feature values uh, the features is extracted and quantized and uh, it, yeah if it's non quantized it's we can do that for TTS you don't need quantized features you compute the linear prediction um, yeah just the LPC, LPC coefficients and use that to form prediction of the past samples you as input to the system you use the upsampled feature vector it's upsampled uh, through uh, convolutional nets and two layers of uh, fully connected ones so uh, the, the, the feature vectors is co uh, concatenated with the prediction from the from that's formed by up. The, the prediction is basically the um, linear combination of past samples you see s10 and the order the lpc order here is 16. we also use uh, the, the prediction is in and also the the last sample is also used it's just this is just to make it make it easier uh, to have a little, it have, uh, have that the last sample as uh, explicitly so and also the residual error coming down that's fed into two grooves actually one big one which is the main one uh, and then a smaller one and then a do uh, what do you call a dual combination of uh, uh, fully connected layers and just a softmax as uh, in softmax as in the original wave net or, or the wave rnn with only the cores you can see it as and <clears throat> that will give us the network will give us as always just a, uh, predict uh, the probability of probability density function the, uh, the distribution which we sample and get the excitation and that excitation is is also is, is recursively put into as, as conditioning but is also added to the prediction of the past output samples and that gets us the sample all right this is the t that was the, the the speech synthesis part okay for coding again we need features right and we need code so the origin after the original uh, LPC net paper we we actually made build the build the codec to that into speech last year so we could we uh, got it down to 1.6 kilobits per second anyways the features used in this codec version of LPC net uh, are the features are extracted every 10 milliseconds but in order to reduce the bit rate we pack pack them all into 40 millisecond uh, packets so the transmission frame or the package is every 40 milliseconds you pack all four, four frames together the features we use is a capstrol representation capstrom representation of the spectral envelope a pitch and a pitch period oh there is an error there <laughs> uh, Let's see. We have a pitch. I think basically it's it uh, because the capstrel also gets the get the gain. And yeah, it's, and the pitch period. Okay, the, 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 what's missing here is the pitch, uh, the uh, the voicing. Uh, whether it's voice or voice, but the voicing is it's it's a uh, soft it's a correlation it's a pitch gain basically or or how much of, uh, how peri periodic it is all right and how do we get the pitch yeah we do correlation simple cross correlation um in the residual domain this per Wow. <laughs> yeah, I have this reduced perceived noise in every slide. I don't know. That's that's not. It's uh, it's on five millisecond subframe. Anyways, uh, quantization is the important important one. So <coughs> we quantize uh, the pitch, the average pitch over entire packets, which is forty millisecond. That's a long 
time for only a single pitch value. So we, we need to uh, be able to, to modulate or change the pitch during these 40 milliseconds. So we, have, we spend three bits on, how, on a modulation or uh, how the pitch can vary during those 40 milliseconds. And then two bits for the, uh, the, the, gain, the, the periodicity, the voicing value. The spectral envelope is coded with, through this kepstrel. And the kepstrel coefficients are obtained uh, from uh, nonlinear, non-uniform bands, bark bands. The bark scale is, which is, resembles a little bit the, uh, spec, uh, the perceptual uh, way of uh, the, the, uh, rep uh, representing the, uh, the spect uh, spectrum. So we take 18 non bands, spectral bands, and get, cook, uh, get the Krebs coefficients through uh, inverse DFTs there from that. And those Krebs coefficients are quantized a little bit, kind of uh, a little bit sophisticated in the sense that we have, uh, we quantized every, the quantize the last frame in each packet with a fixed quantizer. Then we try to predict or interpolate the other ones and in back back and forth a little bit with different tech. And all of these are vector quantization. I don't really need to go into details there. But in the end of the day, we which transmit the uh, the bits bit allocation for this coding scheme is total 64 bits for 40 milliseconds, which in the end calculates to 1.6 kilobits per second. Uh, during training, yeah, this is kind of practical details. <coughs> so some training. Uh, mechanism we did here to make it sound better was to add noise to the input to kind of reduce the effect that we're in training we're not using the since we're this is based on on the linear prediction so we should have had the uh, previous uh, previously coded versions because the, in the but we're not be using teacher forcing from a true one and that will kind of deviate after a while unless so we add some noise to kind of compensate a little bit for that uh, and another thing that we noticed was when you do for when you, when you do it for coding you have to start with not quantizing anything so do unquantized features and then freeze freeze uh, the the actual uh, wave RNN part and just retrain the uh, the uh, conditioning stack with quantized features. Uh, that's in the end what sounds best. Just just a tip if you're ever going to do this. So the more interesting thing here now because this LPC net quantized one we tried it on different uh, diff different systems on regular CPUs, it, um, it works very well on 386 uh, Linux. We tried on Linux, uh, but it doesn't really matter. But, um, but for, for CPUs on 386 type, uh, we get like, f like 14 to 20% percent real time of the core. So that, that's, that's good. Um, on a phone, a Neon phone, Snapdragon from two different generations, uh, the Pixel 3 and the Galaxy S10. Actually, they should be, uh, okay. We have also an iPhone and it works on iPhone too. I don't remember the number, but uh, it's uh, clearly real time. 
uh, for fun, we also tried on a Raspberry Pi, but that was not real time. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's pretty fast anyway on, on a Raspberry Pi. So this is kind of the motivation for doing it. So, so it really runs fast, the CPU. Uh, any questions? Okay, how does it sound compared to others then? Yeah, to the left one. So we, first we can just take the LPC net compared to, uh, uh, this is unquantized. This is just the synthesis part of uh, our feature driven synthesis. We had, uh, we, we typically nowadays do a Mushra like because we have, uh, we're looking at, we, at Google, we have a kind of crowdsourced listening test we have like a mechanical Turk style uh, so you can easily get 100 or more listeners and, and they rate uh, all these uh, all these samples of course we have to be careful when you do crowdsourcing you have to filter out uh, you have to do a lot of post-processing of the results but in the end of the day uh, you can see here that the confidence intervals are pretty small so uh, I, I've I strongly believe that this is kind of accurate, or this is not kind of, this is accurate. This is reliable results. And in the left, in the left we have com comparison with the reference and Mula, of course, and that, that um, uh, will sound pretty, pretty good. And on the horizontal axis, we have, this is depending on how big this, the, the, the network is. And, uh, you basically how much you prune it or how big you have uh, dense or so to com compare them all we, we call it dense equivalent units so either it's big or pruned or small and unpruned they give the same dense equivalent units uh, and we compare LPC net to what we call wave RNN plus which is people could say wave RNN Plus minus, <laughs> it's it's minus because we're not using we're not using uh, this this two 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 stage uh, fine coarse resolution. That means that the Mula is the kind of how, how good it can sound. Uh, but uh, we all we used all the other stuff that uh, it's basically up to CNET without prediction. So it's our version of wave RNN. But the reason why we call it plus is because we had this noise shaping that I think sounds really good, uh, but that might not be needed in regular way of our names. Uh, and uh, also, uh, uh, we still can do pre, uh, we can do sparse, spar sparseness thing where we can, since we have a low 8-bit one, we can pre-compute pre a lot of the matrices and make, make the computational very, very efficient. So whether or not it's called plus or minus, it's, it's, not, it's, it's our version of wave RNN. And we can see here that given the same equivalent unit, using, using, using an LPC, using linear prediction to take care of the spectral envelope improves. So that's the motivation for using LPC net to get, get the, either get the quality up for the same complexity or get the same, got lower complexity for the same quality. So, and the coding part, when we, when we quantize this, we compare to, uh, we compare to the reference, which is, uh, uh, let's see, reference, I don't know. Yeah, I think it's Mula. No, I think it's Mula actually. So the reference is Mula. No, it's not. Oh, sorry. So that's the, the original there. Uh, we have two. We have two sets. We have the. We we trained on entity data, the database from entity, uh, and it has a it has a designated test set too. Is it disjunct and different speakers and all that? But again, same type of. Uh, recording conditions uh, so that's that's the first set uh, we also took it another set which is from the opus uh, codec uh, uh, the ietf opus had some test vectors for compliance test and 
we took took those test vectors. Funnily, it it, it sounded better on the the disjunct test set from a different uh, recording. So up, uh, apparently the opus set is easier to code. But more importantly here is that we compare to the LPC net and quantize from the left. Uh, and no, so it's an unquantized LPC net. Uh, and Opus, which is a waveform match encoder, run at nine kilobits per second, and our LPC net at 1.6 kilobit per second, and MELP, like we used in the previous uh, slides, at 2.4. And here we have Speaks wideband at four kilobits per second, and Speaks uh, Speaks wideband at four is also as, almost as bad as Speaks narrowband at. 2.4 we had in the previous one, but it's also serving as, a, as, an, as an anchor. So it, it, it sounds good enough. Uh, it's much better than MELP and it's closer to, close to Opus at nine, but not quite yet there. So uh, I'm also gonna talk about another way of using LPC in Ed. Uh, it's what we talked about at Interspeech last year, is that even if you have a codec we can uh, you can replace like you if you have a, an opus decoder or like a, a waveform matching hybrid coding. So the new thing here is we're actually going to try waveform matching coding, not only uh, uh, the parametric vocoder. Like we're going to use a waveform matching coder to see if you can do the same thing there. Take its feature, quantize features, and instead of driving this. Uh, its own synthesis, use it to drive uh, a uh, generative synthesis. We are using uh, the LPC net and we're also comparing it to using a wave net as we did before. That's just to, to get us kind of an upper limit of how, we, how well we can do with Opus features. And, and you remember we did, uh, we had, we can do really well with coding two features, but can we also do, <coughs> Excuse me. Can we also do well with uh, uh, <coughs> with the uh, waveform matching codec uh, features? Uh, the reason why it might not go, go so well is that in wave, as you remember from the analysis by synthesis, it's all kind of feedback uh, back. And the analysis is done through synthesis. So if you remove that, if you if um, if you don't use the synthesizer as it was analyzed with it might be a mismatch. So let's cross our fingers. And so we take the conditioning features from, from Opus Bitstreams. And we, we, take, not, we take a few of them only. We only need uh, some pitch and some spectral envelope uh, and some power parameters. Same thing here. Uh, we do... Uh, Musher test with crowdsourced listening. And if we compare here, if we do, if we take Opus, so we code Opus at six kilobits per second. So that's the, uh, the one next, uh, almost further right. That's if you use, so, so the three ones in the middle, they all use the same features, all use the same bit stream. If we take Opus is itself and generate speech, we at six kilobits per second, it's pretty bad. That's basically where it breaks down for for wideband. If we use it to put, if we use it to drive a wave net, which is of course not implementable in the in the human world, uh, you get high quality. You get the same quality, actually better than Opus run at nine kilobits per second. Uh, a good trade-off is to use LPC net, which is actually implementable and runs in real time. And so if you use LPC net with these features, you get in, somewhere in the middle. So this is just an example of you can actually, so you can use LPC net as a post-processor for any, for, so you can need to get kelp coder or whatever. If you have the processing power, you can choose to make it sound better uh, if you 
than its its own synthesis. All right, I'm going to spend the last ten minutes or quick fifteen minutes about uh, before we actually talk. We can get questions later. So talk about an approach we've done to because we we need to make it we want to i want to build a real codec and then you have to address the how to get rid of noise or cope with noise and one way we tr we approached it was to to do uh so we uh, we have one approach that i'll talk about here we're focusing just to get robustness again uh we'll use WaveNet because we want to know if this approach is a, is a good one or not. Uh, we know that this will not be, this cannot be implementable, but just to see if the system, because to my ears, uh, the best synthesizer that I have ever set my, uh, put my hands on is uh, DeepMind's implementation of WaveNet. So I'm going to continue using it. And uh, so we disregard complexity for this study, for sure. That's the, uh, was oh this is interspeed 1990 2020 oh, 2019 yeah so it's an error last year's okay uh so the thing is that yeah we're we know that they're perform best when synthesizing from what single source uh, I haven't, uh, I, the people at uh, WaveNet, I think, have done, you can use WaveNet not only for speech, you can use it for piano, you can use it for single instruments, but for a single source like speech, it's really good. And these generative models perform best. So, we want to synthesize clean speech because we know it's good at it. But how can you do that in a noisy scenario? Yeah, we try to get features that will look the same regardless of its clean speech or noisy speech. And that's the idea to extract, extract features that are noise robust. That's what we do in this codec. So for instance, if we put an input set of all these recordings with a clean speech, the same clean speech with different types of noise. So it's the same, same clean, so we have a set of perceptually equivalent, we can call it, like especially for for uh, for intelligibility, and, and we want to get the get features that disregard the background noise and just get the essential features for speech. That's the that's the that's the goal at least. So, in that sense, we have we have a set of identical networks it's it's it, we call it clones because they are identical in the sense of the weights but all of these it's uh, you might have heard of siamese networks this is siamese but several siamese with several twins it's clones so it's not it's triplets quadruplets or whatever uh, so all of these uh, identical system here here we can uh, they, they get oh different inputs but different inputs representing is essentially the same. So we, we hope that the, the, the network can learn to extract features that will be the same for all of these. So to do that, we need different, uh, we need some losses for, the, this is just a feature extraction network. So in, instead of having man-made uh, uh, spectrum envelope pitch or whatever we try to we hope that the system can learn to uh, get that in cells so we have training losses one loss is to tr hope that try to force them to get similar so these uh, these features from each network should be similar so that that's the, one of the uh, distortions the first one then we force them to have a, 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 we want them to have a, a forced distribution. We want them to be Laplacian, so factorized, uh, to, because that encourages disentanglement. So you can control different things with the same simple features. 
for that we use a maximum mean discrepancy loss that you can learn about elsewhere uh, then we also have the output of the decoder so this looks very much like an autoencoder right so you want to take the input get a latent feature and get then decode it and you want the decoded uh, representation be as similar as possible to the input so after the, after the, after feature extraction and decoding you want you want the to be similar so that's i would call that an uh, an autoencoder loss we also add some noise here to the latent letter layer at training that will hopefully get us kind of a smooth mapping and if you look so here's some details of we we don't take the speech itself we extract features and then we get to another set of features we take the log mel spectral coefficients and with a network of it's yeah it's a one convolutional uh, it's a convolution dilated convolutional convolution it's a dilated convolutional but also a few uh, uh fully connected ones from these let's see 160 or 360 depending on uh lots of mel spectra we try to learn 12 latent features and then we have a decoder that looks the same but the other reverse it looks it's very similar to an autoencoder structure but remember we have like clones of these autoencoders and quantization of this is done very crudely or not crudely but it's uh it's a standard way for, for high rate codecs to do. You use, uh, you use the uniform scalar quantizer and you use, after you quantize these with the scalar quantizer, you do entropy coding for each latent uh, variable. Scale, everything is scalar. And, and for that, we have an upper bound. We, you can just, so we know what the entropy coder will give us. Uh, we haven't really implemented the entropy coding, but this um, you, you get very we get 0.25 less or error maximum. So it's the same feature again. Like this is like you've seen this big figure now like many times. Take the quantized speech feature, drive WaveNet, and get some output speech. The only difference from like the, the original WaveNet era is that we. We want uh, in EpiCNet we use at eight bits, but in this in this uh, in this codec we use sixteen bits to get even better quality, and we're not using uh, two coarse and fine structure with softmax. We use a simple discretized logistic mi mi mixtures, like uh, the the DeepMind guys did in Pixel CNN. Uh, so it's you just have a simple PDF and discretize it uh, here's some I don't know this is so interesting but uh, we use eight clones that's interest that's um, uh, important to know maybe and what happens what the, the bit rate becomes uh, about two two kilobits per second it's it's variable bit rate will so that's approximately 1.8 to compare this, we go back. In the first paper we did codec two. Now we did do MELP just to, just for the hell of it. Take another one. To just took a vocoder, extract the features, and feed the same WaveNet. In order to get comparable, we had to change the frame size a little bit. So the MELP went up to 2.2 2.7 kilobits instead of the standard 2.4. Uh, I think, I don't know, if it's some interesting thing here to see is like these learned features, you, you can, they are pretty, pretty uh, uh, independent from each other, from the correlation. Uh, and you can see some kind of uh, linguistic or features here that one feature seems to be uh, the general power, like feature uh, gain of the feature one and feature two here. Uh, it seems to be kind of the power in the upper band versus the lower band. So it's kind of a um, uh, spectral high band, um, low band 
thing. I've, yeah, you see, it's very low and with the fricatives. That's when a high frequency, and then it's higher at the voiced segments. Yeah. I don't know if that's so interesting. Again, so the listening tests are the most interesting thing. So, again, crowdsourced graders. Uh, the reference. Uh, so let's see, it's the best thing to compare here is, yeah, so we have the clean conditions, 10 dB uh, signal to noise ratio and zero dB signal to noise ratio for the, uh, the street and cafe noise and stuff that we put from Freesound. So <clears throat> let's start at the clean one. Yeah, the clones, even for, for clean speech, the learned features are better than uh, the man-made melt ones. Well, that kind of goes all the way here. It's always better than the melt ones. That's good, um, even for clean. And another thing that's interesting is that at, yeah, also it helps. Like look at the zero dB and a 10 dB. Oh, you can zero, uh, it's, it's I don't know, 10 dB, that zero dB, I think that's the one where we have the actual, the noisy, the noisy itself as a, one of the anchor. Uh, the clones are better than the noisy original. So the, the clones network, the features manages to do a little, since it learns the clean features and then uh, synthesize the clean speech, it does a little bit of uh, speech enhancement on it. Uh, so somewhat, Okay, results, I feel. Yeah, just as I said. <laughs> All right. Yep, I think that concludes my talk. And uh, I'm open for questions. Okay, thank you, Jan. Thank you for all of this effort. Uh, after a long trip back from Europe with jet lag, <laughs> really, <laughs> we appreciate your effort. Yeah, questions. Oh, actually, that's not the title. Let's go back again. I changed the title because I forgot what I gave Janis. Uh, go back to the first one. This is, yes. Yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, questions. Uh, of course, we use also, because many people are, will not be available right now. Yeah. Uh, it is too late for them. Um, so we use Slack, and uh, if you are, if you are already in the Slack channel for SPCC, so you will see the dates, the days. And then yeah. people uh, push there for questions. Okay, good. So you might you might get questions also through the, the Slack channel if there are no questions. But okay, let's wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, and uh, yeah, questions. Let's see if someone raise any hand. How, how do you raise the hand? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, where do you say participants here? You, okay, just you can speak. There is a okay. raised hand. I think is in uh, Apple. Okay. Is control A. Ask, I think something like that. Right. Can, I, can I have a go with question without raising a hand? I'm sorry about this. Oh. Yes, you can. You can. Hey, Petko. Hey, good to yeah. see you. <laughs> nice color. Um, listen, I, I missed half an hour from the part after WaveNet, so I don't think you've touched on this, but I, I just want to ask you more of a conceptual question. So um, my impression was that you didn't touch a lot on rate distortion theory, and I think I, had, I understand why, in a sense. I guess, given your experience, my question for you is, um, do you think that rate distortion theory has helped us build better coders, or has it always been sort of a method of comparison? Uh, it's been really good in for theoretical trying to get limits, like trying to figure out what, how much we can do and what's reasonable. I, in the end of the day, you always have to build something and the rate distortion and high rate thing, it, 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 it's, it's mostly a tool and it helps for inside, but for actual design, not so much. 
That's right. So it, it basically starts with an engineering idea, then you you code it out, then you test it, and then you check, let's say, what, what, how close you are to the limits based on the... Yeah, but the okay. The, 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 depend, for the high rate, like high rate theory, like, like the way we did, the, uh, it, it's in well-known and, and actually in... In codecs like Opus, for instance, and, and Silk, uh, the concept of uniform quantization uh, followed by entropy coding, uh, that, that works. And that's very, that's, that's very straightforward. Uh, in Opus, it's taking, because scalar quantization is always uh, uh, you know, theoretically in f worse than vector quantization. So you can get a little bit better. Uh, so, so you're using lattice co co lattice quantization, and that's that's what's done in in in, uh, in Opus, but it's, the entropy coding is uh, is essential, and it it's very simple. So so yeah, that part I think is been useful even for design, but like rate distortion theory to get limits because that's what it does, right? Rate distortion is kind of if you have infinite delay, how 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 much can you do? Thanks. Other questions? Uh, hi, yeah, I would also have a question. Um, so if I understand it well, the, the design uh, or, or the choice to, do, to how to deal with the noise is to kind of get rid of it. Is this right? Yep. Okay, uh, is this, uh, I mean, is this because it, it, it would be too hard to also model it or, I mean, uh... Uh, Yes. Okay. Uh, the thing is that speech model, speech sounds are, as we've seen here, uh, in the high dimensional signal space, it is on a very narrow ma manifold. So when, when you use, when you use this, learning you can you can learn this manifold and project it down to the speech speech signal domain or the signal domain generals so however uh, the background noise will kind of uh, make the sound uh, the, the manifold bigger which is har harder to um, for so far in, in my experience is it's harder to to capture it uh, in when you try to learn learn the representation and what I think um, what what happens is that when you train if you you mean like for the for the training when you have a uh, teacher forcing the target if you take the target being noises you try to try to predict try to generate noisy speech you in general you get better slightly better in noisy speech but the cost is also because now now you can generate noisy speech you're not so good at generating clean speech anymore so if the input is very clean you will tend to generate kind of noisy noisy speech and that's that's the cost you, you can't get both sure so as is in some sense the model kind of saturating already for clean speech like it's good at it but yes if you ask it to do more then it has to be to get worse at uh, yeah, it, it's it's saturated in the sense that it it learns very well to do it, and especially uh, especially WaveNet because WaveNet seems since you can WaveNet is a little bit more robust in the sense that it learns a little bit more, but it also that means that it, oh, it's not robust in the sense, but it, it's that's why I guess a high quality it, it can real it can really learn the speech uh, manifold. Uh, LPC net and wave RNN, uh, you, so, so to get, so, so noisy speech with wave net is babble. Mm -hmm. Noisy speech with wave RNN and LPC net is babble, but less severe. So since they are, they are not, so that trade off a little bit of modeling this clean speech, because if you compare wave net and LPC net, uh, um, I might, yeah, I, I, I might send some samples with on the um, uh, the hands-on because LPC net is good, but WaveNet is better. So.
So, uh, oh. and dogs in the background is going to be really hard to call. To call. <laughs> uh, so, what, what was the okay. question? Uh, yeah. So, 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 so the trade-off is that you you lose you lose the clean speech if you want to capture the, the noisy speech. And so far, uh, there's there might be some there might be some. I mean, this is something that we're we're looking into, and other people who want to build. Uh, I, I don't know if they want to build a real codec. You have to look into this. And so far, the best approach is to get rid of the noise. Okay, thanks. Okay, there is a question, Delalais. Yeah. Um, so, what about uh, not noisy speech, but poorly recorded, for example, uh, with a phone microphone or something like that? Did you try that with uh, WaveNet? Uh, yeah, uh, that actually, they, it's also, uh, in, L in LPCNet that is, um, it's, it's kind of in the training. So in the LPCNet, we, we randomize a spectral shape. So there is, there is a small, uh, filter, a random filter in front of all speech when we, uh, uh augment the data by filtering it. Uh, so LPCNet is, is more robust to that, and uh, even uh, even WaveNet uh, is it's not it's not so crucial. I don't I don't think the um, any kind of linear filtering is is problematic. Okay, thanks. Uh, 